Do you know what this is? I do. Whew, we did it. Super nerds, we did it. Thank you to Because Science for surpassing one million subscribers. This is a giant gold plaque signifying our nerdery and our pursuit of all things technical. Thank you so much for your support over the last couple of months, the last year or so. I could not have done it without all of you, all of the Because Science team. This means a lot to me, but it would mean even more if it was actually made out of solid gold because it would weigh 56 kilograms based on the density of gold and based on the current price of gold. This would be worth $2.4 million. That's more than a million, but it's priceless to me. Does that make sense? Sure. Thank you. Welcome to another edition of Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all of your comments, questions, and corrections, and I... <laughs> Sorry, I forgot what I was talking about. And then I tell you what's coming up next on this channel. Hint! How do they make the noise in the comics? That's it, right? about Spider-Man. But getting right into it, in the last episode of Because Science, we were talking all about the science of Chernobyl, what actually happened in the worst nuclear reactor disaster in human history. It was kind of a different uh, change of pace for the episode, a different tone, a lot more serious tone, not as many jokey joke em up as I like to say, but I think a lot of you like the direction that we are taking, and if you like more of the hard science explainer type video, make sure you're commenting on this video for more episode ideas that we could do in that same vein. And there's not really a whole lot of opinion injected into the Chernobyl episode. I kind of just did my best to explain the bits and pieces. And likewise, you all had a different kind of comment for last week's video. So let's get into that right now. And before we begin, I should say that because Chernobyl has such a large topic covering so many different spheres from politics to physics to engineering, I did not include everything I possibly could in my Chernobyl video. I left some things out. I simplified other things. Hey, it's a 14 minute video. I did my best. So necessarily I could not get to everything, but we'll get to that in some of your comments. The first comment comes from Jithin Rajan who says, Kyle, haven't, we haven't really figured out what to do with nuclear waste, thorium reactor. What am I, a joke to you? So if you haven't heard of thorium reactors before, it's a different kind of nuclear reactor that could deal more with our nuclear waste problem in that they would produce less nuclear waste than something like a uranium nuclear reactor. And they have many potential advantages. Like it's much harder to make a thorium nuclear bomb. Say if some nefarious people got into your nuclear power plant and they stole all the fuel and they tried to turn it into a bomb, it'd be much harder. Second of all, there's a lot more thorium than there is uranium in the Earth's crust and so it's a lot more available, and so you could get energy from it easier. However, I will say that thorium reactors, as far as I can tell, are much less proven technology. At least they haven't been researched as much, and they haven't been put into practice as much as our uranium fission reactors. So thorium might be the answer to our problems, but that's hard to say practically right now. Frequent commenter Kenny Martin says, for footnotes, you should go over modern reactors and how they solved or attempted to solve the problem of a positive void coefficient. So if you haven't seen the episode or the HBO miniseries, what we're talking about with a positive void coefficient is that in the Chernobyl Unit 4 reactor, it was an RBMK reactor more specifically, and it had a positive void coefficient. What does this mean? Well, because it used coolant water uh, in between its fuel rods, if that water turned into steam near those fuel rods, the steam is not as good at absorbing neutrons as regular old water is. So if a lot of steam starts being created, say a runaway influx of power, Power, and it heats up all the water really quickly. If you generate a lot of steam that creates voids and all of those voids increase the reactivity of the reactor because more neutrons are getting through those voids than otherwise would through that same void if it was filled with water. And that creates a positive feedback loop of steam, increased reactivity, more steam, increased. Re so it gets it until you get what happened in Chernobyl. 
after the Chernobyl incident, these kind of reactors went through a lot of redesigning. For one thing, they would increase the number of manual control rods. The reactor in Chernobyl had around 30. They increased that to 45. They would add 80 additional absorbers to inhibit operation at low power, and they would make some control rod modifications and add additional neutron absorbers, say, if a lot of those voids were being created. So this major design flaw was addressed in future reactors, and though having a positive void coefficient doesn't necessarily mean your reactor is going to melt down. Having a very high one that isn't accounted for can mean disaster. So we work to lower those positive void coefficients as much as we can, and reactors like we use in the U.S., across the U.S., have negative void coefficients. Wow, a lot of serious questions. Uh, Izzy says, how hard would you have to sniff a pie to float off the ground and follow the aroma trail? <laughs> what? Okay, so you know in cartoons when a character smells a pie on a windowsill and they're like, Oh, how, how hard would you have to sniff to do that? Does that even make sense? No? Yes, maybe. All the answers. No, what you would want to do is create a vacuum inside of your head. You'd want to inhale so quickly and so forcefully that the difference between the pressure on the outside of your body, atmospheric pressure, and the inside of your body was 14.7 pounds per square inch. That is to say, inside your nasal cavity, it would be a pressure of zero, like space. And then air would be forced as quickly as it possibly could into your face. Now, if enough air was forced into your face, it could provide uh, a large enough momentum change from that air if it was going at the speed of sound into your nose. <laughs> <laughs> it was going at the speed of sound into your nose. At some mass of air, it would, it would create enough momentum to maybe lift you off the ground. But I am positive that the most air you can inhale will not be enough mass to give you the momentum change to move you off the ground. You just can't sniff that hard. Me. 2019. <laughs> Blarg McBlargson says, uh, for something so dangerous, corium, which is when the nuclear reactor melted down, its fuel rods melted down and mixed with parts of the melted uh, core and mixed with the concrete and the sand they were pouring on it, it forms this uh, mass of radioactive lava that we dub Corium. Well, Corium, uh, Blarg says, doesn't have much gravitas to it. It's like the physical manifestation of someone saying, core, blimey. Are you saying corium isn't scary enough a term? Let's think of another one that's scarier. I would call I would call it a lava lanch. Mm -hmm. Lava lanchula? Sci-fi? Call me. Uh, I think that's already a movie. Uranium lava. Lava lanium. You're welcome. Reactoid. That sounds like an. It sounds like a stupid villain. Patrick Wilkins says, "Hey Kyle, love the show. Question: If the elephant's foot stayed hot enough to eventually eat it his way through the crust to the mantle of the earth, I'm presuming, would it affect uh, in some way, big or small?" Well, right now, the elephant's foot is not hot enough to make it all the way to the center of the Earth. I don't even know if that's the right question we should be asking. However, what you are saying gets at a good point. They were actually worried, the engineers uh, inspecting Chernobyl after the disaster, they were worried that the radioactive lava would continue to eat through the basement of Chernobyl and then into the ground and then hit the groundwater in that ground and create another steam explosion that would throw out even more radiation and radioactive particles and particulate matter into the atmosphere and then across uh, that part of Europe. So your point gets at something interesting. They actually were worried that the elephant's foot would do this. So you're right on the money or the corium, which I'm choosing to call I'm gonna call it lava. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I'm giving to Positronium, who says, you got physics right. <laughs> Good work breaking down an esoteric subject for the public. I was very pleased when you mentioned the positive void coefficient of reactivity. The xenon and samarium oscillations contributed to the control rods being removed as much as they were. You can thank the macroscopic neutron absorption cross-section of steam and graphite for the positive void coefficient of reactivity. In case anyone was wondering, U.S. power reactors are light water reactors, either pressurized or boiling, which are a completely different design than the one discussed and with proper containment buildings. Uh, both pressurized and boiling water 
water reactors have negative uh, coolant moderator and void coefficients of reactivity, which means the water, coolant and moderator, temperature increases or vaporizes, the reactor output decreases instead of increases like it did at Chernobyl. Pressurized water reactors use chemical shims to control the rate of reaction growth. Wow, that's a lot of technical words, Prositronium, and I'm glad you liked the episode. And thank you for explaining what we have done in our reactors to avoid this kind of catastrophe, which isn't very likely and may not be as bad as you may think, but we'll get to that in a second. So for all that, Positronium, you are indeed a super nerd. I'm positive that you are. But of course, I'm not always right. I can't be. That's just human. <laughs> So what did I get wrong last week? Our first correction comes from Abdur, who says, you forgot about the buildup of xenon in the core, which is why they pulled out so many of the control rods at Chernobyl. Because of the xenon uh, poisoning, the core nearly stopped producing any power at all. Anyways, great episode. You should definitely watch the whole series. It is very well done. I agree. So what Abdur is describing here and what is mentioned in the HBO miniseries is that because they let the reactor operate for so long at low power, there was a buildup of an isotope of xenon. Xenon-135. And when there's a buildup of this specific isotope, it is an extremely good neutron absorber. And if you let this happen, so much xenon can build up that it absorbs so many neutrons that the reaction will just stop. And then that xenon can hang around such that you cannot start the reactor back up in a certain amount of time, if at all. So this is called neutron poisoning or xenon poisoning of the core, like was in the HBO mini series. So this is what they were talking about. And this had something to do with the reactor meltdown that ensued and all of the design flaws and the human error that went into it. We left it out in the episode because I felt like it was just a little bit extra that didn't necessarily need all the explaining that everything else did. And like I said, it was only a 14 minute video, but that is a good point, Abdur. Caitlin Baker says sand, clay, and other materials. I said when the graphite fires were raging for nine days at Chernobyl, they were pouring sand, clay, and other materials to put out those fires. And Caitlin goes on to say, well, the other materials that you mentioned were lead and boron. The sand was used to try to smother the reaction and try to prevent further smoke, which carried radioactive particulate matter, dust, which is incredibly damaging, more so than the actual beams of radiation shooting out is the particles that travel as dust and get carried on the wind and go everywhere across Europe and get, you know, and just coat people's hair and clothes and vegetation. That's a dangerous bit. While the boron was supposed to reduce the reaction itself as a neutron absorber. That was a theory, unfortunately, due to the circumstances and difficulty in accurately dropping the materials in, it didn't work as planned and pretty much no boron managed to reach the core to slow down the reaction. Fascinating. That's all I got. It's just good information. That's why I did this episode in the first place. There's so many little details, so many fascinating little things. The more you dig into it, uh, the more you get out of it. Our next correction comes from Rena Gall and Andres Am Enix, who says, it's not Russian, it's USSR. It's not a failed Russian reactor, it's the Soviet Union reactor in Ukraine. My bad. I said Russian reactor when I did not take into account in 1986, this would not be how you would describe it, and that's my bad. That's on me. You know what? <sighs> I'm gonna have to give this back. But the nerdiest reaction at the time I'm filming this episode, I'm giving to Alex Vogel, who says, for as horrifying as a nuclear meltdown is, and the giant uninhabitable exclusion zone on a macro scale, how does the damage caused by Chernobyl actually compare to normal fossil fuel power plants? How does the radioactive fallout released during one meltdown compare to two centuries of fossil fuel emissions? How do the deaths due to radiation in these incidents compare to the deaths caused by cancer and lung disease in China and India and other regions that heavily pollute due to their reliance on fossil fuels. Basically, for as horrible as Chernobyl was, is it equal to fossil fuel pollution? So this is a good point, and I'm highlighting it as the super nerd correction of the week because I have been vocal on this show and this channel before that nuclear power gets a lot of bad PR. And I'm not excusing anything that happened. Nuclear power, when it goes wrong, can be very, very scary. But what we have to remember here is context. So if you compare it to something like fossil fuel emissions, how does it actually stack up? Is it cleaner? Is it more dangerous? When you hear about a meltdown, yes, that's terrifying and it sounds incredibly dangerous, but how does it actually stack up? Well, if you go to a place like NASA, who puts out a report just a couple of years 
years ago, six years ago, called coal and gas are far more harmful than nuclear power, you can find little tidbits like this. Quote, using historical electricity production data and mortality and emission factors from the peer-reviewed scientific literature, we found that despite the three major nuclear accidents the world has experienced, nuclear power has prevented an average of over 1.8 million net deaths worldwide between 1971 and 2009. This amounts to at least hundreds and more likely thousands of times more deaths than it caused. An average of 76,000 deaths per year were avoided annually between 2000 and 2009 with a range of 19,000 to 300,000 per year. They go on to say, quote, likewise, we calculated that nuclear power prevented an average of 64 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent net greenhouse gas emissions globally between 1971 and 2009. This is about 15 times more emissions than it caused. So across the board, what we find if we look into pollution related deaths from fossil fuels, fossil fuels cause many, many times more deaths, hundreds if not thousands of times more deaths than nuclear power. And despite, like the report says, despite the very attention-grabbing headline disasters that we have experienced, the fact is it is cleaner, it produces more energy per kilogram of fuel, and it causes less human suffering. So when you have all of these factors in front of you, you kind of have to ask yourself, is my fear justified knowing what I know about the actual statistics. And yes, exclusion zones, fallout, it all evokes this terribleness, this sense of post-apocalyptic in our heads. But when you look at the numbers, you might wanna rethink your stance. To me, nuclear power does seem like something that can bridge the gap between our reliance on fossil fuels and whatever the future may bring. But that's for everyone to decide themselves, even though you're wrong. So, for pointing out that important comparison, Alex, you are indeed a super nerd. Not so bad. In context, there's no coffee in here. Now, moving on to this week's episode. This week's episode of Because Science is, huh, what would actually happen if a radioactive spider bit you? Radiation two weeks in a row, huh? That's right, dealing again with radiation and just in time for Spider-Man Far From Home, we are trying to go back to Peter Parker's origin story to evaluate what would actually happen if an actually radioactive spider bit you on the hand. Would you get superpowers? Would you wake up not needing your glasses and have nerd abs? Or would you just get radiation poisoning? One of these is more likely. <laughs> So go watch the latest episode of Because Science if you haven't yet, all about Chernobyl and how it all went down, at least according to me, and leave me all of your nerdiest comments, corrections, and questions at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter, where you can suggest ideas for future episodes, interact with me, and pff, I don't know, I'll respond to you with a gif of myself. And don't forget, just like nuclear energy may not be as scary as you think in the context of the larger numbers at work here, context matters. For example, we see headlines all the time of like kids getting hurt or millennials getting hurt, like taking selfies or something like that. And we're like, oh, that's a huge problem. But do you know that like seven kids a day are injured on bouncy castles? I looked it up. So many kids are hurt on them. Stop bringing them to your park. Ban bouncy castles. Ban all of them.